So good morning. Great. Well, welcome. I'm going to ask those at the back to come on down. There's a few more empty seats around, and we can maybe and um, pull in some more chairs if we need to. So um, terrific to see you all. Um, I'm Hilary Baker. I'm the Vice President for Information Technology, and it is my absolute pleasure to invite you all here today to the 2011 CSUN Annual Technology Fair. So, I, not 11, I'm four years, four years away. 2015, you wonder where that came from. So let's start again, 2015 Technology Fair, let's go. Um, we have, as we've had in the past, wonderful uh, representation from across the university. We have all divisions represented. We have, I think, all but one of the colleges, and, uh, and we've also got representation from um, auxiliaries. But before we actually get started, I wanted to just um, spend a few minutes to introduce those of you that weren't able to make it to the App Jam showcase to show you a little about it. Um, we've got a little video that we put together to tell the story, and then we're also going to show the top um, two winning student apps. It's our student app competition that was held through the whole month of April. So. Getting to school is a fact of life. Many students need to drive, but so does everyone else. The result? Congestion, stress, no parking. Studies have shown only 7% of students carpool, but 80% would if they had access to rides. Drivers need to find passengers, and passengers need drivers. How? UCarpool brings people together with a full-featured app. Drivers create carpools that happen once or on a recurring basis. They can even set their own price, free, tips, or a set fee. Passengers look for carpools that match their time and destination. The driver sees the route and agrees. The carpools feature lets you review your past and upcoming rides, while finances keeps track of the money you save. Users must register with a valid EDU email address, so you know who you're riding with. Unlike other apps, there's no fees or overhead costs to pay. Flexibility means you're free to do what you want. Pick your days, pick your price. Riding together saves money and resources. It keeps cars off the road and pollutants out of the air. It makes financial sense, and it's good for the community. You save money, you save the air. You carpool.
Uh, you Zoe? Yeah, you're Mark? Yeah, you ready to go? Yeah. As you can see, the AppJam competition just exemplified CSUN's commitment to student success because it really provided students with the opportunity to create something that will benefit other students while exercising innovation and collaborative teamwork. It was an amazing job to see them um, uh, work on this. Um, if you didn't make it to the showcase uh, next year, it'll be called 2016 AppJam. And we're pretty excited about having that, and I have to say that my thanks go to Greg Mina, uh, to Dion Zell, and the whole of the academic technology team for really making it so successful this year. It was really a terrific experience for our students. So, kudos. So back to today, um, uh, and back to, by popular demand, we have New Media Consortium, who will be speaking in just a moment to share their thoughts about technology trends. Uh, and then after lunch, our speaker will talk about the use of technology for engagement and retention. As well as great speakers, um, we also have, uh, over the years and today as well, made the technology fair all about our CSUN vendors. And so this year, we're joined with representatives from Apple, Dell, HP, OnBase, Lynda.com, Microsoft, and SHI. And so if you haven't already done so, I know some of you did ahead of time, but if you haven't already stopped by the booths, please do so over lunch to learn a little more. Now, you all know that it takes an awful lot of people to plan and pull off an event like this one today, so I take um, great pride in Say, sharing with you that it was led by Ben Quillian here, and the core planning team also included Marla Joseph, Julie Arandondo, uh, Cecilia Chavez, Zach Hilbrunner, Bori Hong, Jessica Johnson, Nicole Cashew, Jenny Olson, Blessing Okoli, and Topi Rodriguez. Please join me in thanking all of these and many more who were involved. So without further ado, let me bring up Ben, who will introduce our first speakers today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Quilly, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Information Technology. I, I have to tell you, I've seen those videos now probably 20 times, and I, I get goosebumps every time. It's really just amazing what our, what our students were able to do. Uh, along with Hillary, I'd like to welcome you, and I'm also very pleased to have the honor to introduce our first speakers who will discuss this morning's topic, On the Horizon, Trends, Challenges, and Emerging Technologies in Higher Education. I'm very pleased to welcome back, as Hillary said, Samantha Adams Becker. Samantha is the Senior Director of Communications for the New Horizon, the New Media Consortium, or NMC, and she is the director of the NMC Horizon Project, which analyzes emerging technology trends and their uptake globally in education. She has an expertise in digital communications with a special interest in e-publishing, social media, and online learning. In 2013, she taught the first online course that was ever exclusively took place in Facebook, and it focused on training educational professionals to integrate social media into their teaching curriculum. Joining Samantha today is Dr. Holly Ludgate who has worked in the fields of education, instructional design, and online learning for the last 14 years. Her doctoral degree was awarded from Pepperdine University in Educational Technology, and it focused on gaming immersion in educational settings. In 2007, she became program director at Full Sail University, where she launched the online education media design and technology master's degree program. Currently, she's the senior director for program development at NMC. In 2011, she was also selected as an Apple Distinguished Educator, and she sits on the Challenge-Based Learning Advisory Board, which is also hosted by Apple. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Samantha Adams-Becker and Dr. Holly Ludgate. Uh, 
Oh, thank you so much, Ben, for that warm welcome, and everyone at CSUN for making this experience so wonderful two years in a row. Um, it's really a great honor to be here um, and to present to you the findings of the 2015 um, NMC Horizon Report. Uh, I think you'll find, for those of you that were here last year, there are definitely some interesting overlaps between the 2014 and the 2015 report, but our, this year's expert panelists identified some really brand new topics that I think are all going to that are going to really stretch our thinking even further this year. So if you, oh, here's the clicker. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance yet, um, there's a link to download the 2015 higher ed report. So let's test out the internet bandwidth and I'll download it right now. Uh, so this is the report we're going to be talking about today. And just some really, really quick background on it. Um, we're going to be talking about just some of the topics featured in the report today. There are 18 in total. But even beyond that, the NMC Horizon project examines at least 60 different technologies, tons of trends, tons of challenges. So you're looking at the final product of work that really explored lots of different areas. So if you agree with the topics, if you disagree, we want to hear your opinions and your voices, and we'll be telling you about some of the great ways that you can get involved towards the end of the presentation. So be thinking about how this relates to your own work, how it could relate to your own work, and maybe what you'd like to see discussed in the future. Some logistics. So today, uh, we're going to start with just briefly talking about the project in general. And then we're going to move into the key trends that are accelerating educational technology adoption. From there, we're going to move into the challenges that actually impede this adoption. And then finally, we're going to talk about the important developments within educational technology today, specifically in higher ed for 2015. And we just could not resist the shot of your beautiful sculpture out there. That season sculpture is quite amazing. Uh, and for those of you who may not be familiar um, yet with the NMC, CSUN's actually a member of the NMC. So for those of you who are just learning about it, we hope this is just a jumping off point for you guys to get more involved in the numerous projects that we do. And how many tweeters do we have in the audience? Show of hands. All right, we've got some tweeters. Uh, we like to keep things interactive and keep you on your toes, so feel free to be tweeting throughout the presentation with your reactions. Uh, that's our handle and the hashtag to join the conversation. Positioned throughout the, the presentation strategically are some discussion questions because, as I mentioned, we'd really like this to be a jumping off point for thinking about how you can apply these topics or continue to apply them in your settings. And so we wanted to create the back channel to get those dialogues going. Uh, because who doesn't love a good infographic? This captures all of the topics in this year's report, uh, the trends, the challenges, and the important developments in technology. Um, somewhat new to the NMC Horizon report, for those of you who have been avid readers these past 13 years, is the structure of the report. Uh, it used to focus almost explicitly on the technologies. And repeatedly, we'd hear from you know, people like you well, is it really about the technology or is it the pedagogies and the innovative learning approaches and things like AppJam that are going to pave the way for um, you know, more forward thinking in higher education? So we heard the voices loud and clear and we agree. Uh, and so the way that we position the topics in the report is we like to point out some of the key trends that um, technology can be an enabler of. So consider um, technology to be uh, we'll consider pedagogy and approaches to be Meryl Streep, the stars of the show, and the technologies to be the supporting actors and actresses who, you know, maybe are seamless in the background making this all possible. So we start out by talking about the key trends. And something important to note is we don't just want to identify the trends that we need to be concerned with. We want to identify for how long we're going to need to be concerned about these. Um, so we look at this through the lens of uh, long-term to short-term impact trends. So long-term impact trends are trends that may not even seem new to you. These are trends that have been happening for quite some time, and we're seeing them accelerate further and further out. Um, the shorter-term impact trends it doesn't necessarily mean that they're fads. Remember that all long-term trends may start out being perceived as trends. I give blue jeans as an example. Once a trend, now a mainstay. 
Um, so you never know what's going to happen with these short-term impact trends, and sometimes they're the most interesting to watch. So we're just going to focus on a few of these here today that, um, in talking with Ben, we thought would be particularly insightful for the CSUN community. And the first of which is especially relevant after seeing that App Jam video, um, Advancing Cultures of Change and Innovation. So this trend is really about how our organizations are set up to promote entrepreneurial thinking, exactly evident in what we saw in the App Jam. This is about creating cultures where students feel like they can uh, create something, take risks, experiment, um, and being able to set up programs and initiatives that facilitate that. So um, I remember reading the transcript, transcript of a speech given by the University of Michigan former president a couple years ago, and she was talking about how the innovation that begins at universities is actually tied to national economic progress. And in the research that I've been doing, I've been noticing more and more that um, this, the type of programs like AppJam are actually fostering the breakthrough innovation that creates you know, more progress in society. Um, I remember when I was a student, there was always this mentality of, OK, well, when I graduate, I'm going to change the world. You just wait. But the best thing about AppJam and similar initiatives is students are starting to realize, I don't have to wait until I can graduate. I can start to change the world now. And that's the most powerful notion about this trend, is how can universities, how can organizations foster this mentality and reward students for taking these risks and actually creating materials instead of the, you know, the rote learning that occurs when it's, it's all about the tests. Uh, aside from AppJam, another wonderful example is taking place at the University of Florida through their Innovation Academy. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the Innovation Academy, um, as you'll notice with all these slides, there's a short link at the bottom if you want to learn more. It's easy to, to peruse their website. I'm going to show a short video here because I think they probably can sum up their program a little bit better than I can. Oop. I just love that. For students to be able to call themselves entrepreneurs even before they graduate, get ready workforce. Um, additionally, and I know HP is here, um, I really have to commend HP's HP Life e-learning program, which actually offers a series of free courses to spark entrepreneurial thinking. Um, and there's different types of classes that can be taken online, again, for free, around creating a simple budget, making effective presentations, and all the things that actually go into launching a small business. And, and we're seeing people, uh, institutions like the Singapore University of Management um, actually uh, create programs where outside investors come in and invest in student creations. And uh, it's just amazing to see the seeds that start you know, with students in these universities, what they can become and the possibilities. Uh, in addition to creating this atmosphere of entrepreneurship, the question is, well, how do we measure student progress in these types of creative areas? Um, and especially when it comes to students who may be struggling a little bit more, we know that not everyone is inclined to ask for help. 
Uh, so there needs to be ways for faculty, for instructors, for administrators to be able to assess how well students are grasping concepts on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, technology plays a huge role as in this post-information age, what, how do we interpret all the information that we have? Um, we're, you know, over the past couple years, big data has become a really hot topic, especially as it relates to the big guys like Amazon and Google, but we're really seeing it enter higher education in a major way around assessing student learning, um, being able to not just get a big picture of student attendance, which is great, but to also understand student behavioral patterns. Um, for example, um, if I was a biology instructor in an introductory biology class that had you know, 300 students in it, it's extremely difficult to provide personalized help and attention to each student. So in hybrid environments where students con you know, conduct a lot of the work online, being able to track how long, how much time do they spend on a single passage, how many questions in this online quiz do they get right or wrong, and then give the instructor of that class an overall picture of how the students are doing as a whole. And if a statistic comes back on it, you know, on one of these learning analytics dashboards, oh, it looks like 50% of the students got this question wrong, then the instructor knows to maybe the next class devote more time to the specific subject the students are struggling with. And this directly aids with student retention and graduation rates by identifying where people are struggling and then instructors can step in accordingly to provide that support. This is happening um, really successfully already at the University of Wisconsin. Their student success system um, does just that. They identify at-risk students by analyzing this data. Um, instructors have access to these dashboards and are able to you know, get statistics on individual classes, individual majors, course-wide, school-wide, and it's been really helping them um, not only bolster retention rates, but boost student engagement rates because it's easy to identify which students need more help and then give them the attention that they need. Another major trend identified by the, um, by the expert panel this year was the increase, increasing use of blended learning. So, for our cases, we'll, we'll use blended synonymously with hybrid. What this means are approaches that utilize both face-to-face -face and online learning um, for a best of both worlds type marriage. Um, so we know that students are spending more and more time online um, informally. For example, um, I don't necessarily go to a public library anymore if I want to learn information um, about you know, what's happening, the latest discoveries in outer space. I actually follow NASA, space.com, all of these organizations um, on my Facebook, and I often turn to social media uh, to learn about the things that I'm passionate about and even the things that, you know, and students do this for even the things they might already be studying in school. So to take advantage of students' behaviors online and their interests to pursue this information online, more and more universities are um, facilitating these blended learning environments that really take advantage of the fact that students are already pretty successful at navigating online environments. One example I'd like to call attention to is happening at the University of Central Florida. Um, and there's, there's a link to check it out. Um, so they um, actually conducted a study where they examined face-to-face, -face, blended, and also fully online learn learning models, and they found that the most successful approaches were the blended models. Um, they call this unbundling the classroom because um, students through, this, through the blended models found that um, they're able to get in touch with teachers sometimes easily and more comfortably online. Um, there's less, you know, there's less of a barrier for, for shy students, of course. Um, and when materials and discussion forms are placed online, um, there is more persistent communication between students, and it actually fostered an environment where more peer-to-peer -peer learning was occurring, which actually helps the instructors out a great deal. Um, if a student becomes an expert in one subject and feels comfortable and sees that another student online is struggling or has posed a question, why not rely on um, the expert students as ambassadors for the class at, and have them help answer the questions? I think that's what happens in the contemporary workforce anyways, and so why not have more of that take place in a university setting? So in thinking about some of these trends that we discussed and even some of the ones um, that were mentioned in the report and, and not discussed necessarily in detail today, I'd love for you to just take a moment 
to take it all in and think about how these positive trends um, can be best accelerated at CSUN. Um, I know just in conversations with Ben and, and, and some of you that a lot of them are already taking place on campus, but how, they can, how can they be accelerated? How can they be built stronger? More, how can they scale better? Uh, so using the hashtag NMCHZ, um, feel free to enter in your responses. Towards the end of the presentation, we'll go through some of those responses. And if it feels right, we might read some of them out loud. We'll, we'll see. Um, but while you're doing that, um, I have to say, you know, you can't necessarily look at the, the, the positive as, you know, as much as, as we love being optimistic without noting some of the significant challenges that are impeding educational technology adoption and impeding the progress of these trends. Uh, so Holly is going to take us on, on through the walk on the darker side right now by examining some of the challenges that you may very well be facing in your environment. I love the uh, idea that I get to walk you through the dark side. <laughs> um, all right, so, thank you. Moving into the dark side, first of all, we just looked at the key trends. So now we're going to take a look at these challenges, and we actually break it into three different sectors. Solvable, these are challenges which we know the answer and we know how to essentially get there. So as you can see, we have two solvable. Difficult, these are where we know the answer, but we don't quite know how to get there at this point. And then the wicked challenges are the ones where we don't know the answer, we don't know how to get there, and we don't even know how to begin the conversation. So these are ones we're still trying to understand how to even wrap context around some of these challenges. So taking a look. So our first solvable challenge we're going to be looking at is the blending of formal and informal learning. So looking at traditional teaching approaches with the roots in 18th century, they're very common at institutions. So how do we really take these two ideas of traditional formal learning and the idea of this informal learning and blend and blur these lines? We're really trying to figure out how to do that. I think uh, online learning and a lot of these other offerings online start that conversation. But what are some great examples of blended or formal and informal learning. So first off, the Lifelong Learning Festival. This is actually quite interesting. The Cork Institute of Technology is really taking a deeper look at the idea of informal learning by doing an e-portfolio um, idea. So what they're doing is they're asking for the local community, especially students, to start gathering and collecting information and artifacts related to what they do informally. And so if you go to the link here, there's actually a white paper that explains it a bit better. Um, they had an, a, an event where they actually highlighted the development of the digital archive, where the students pr can present their most uh, influential informal learning experiences as they unfold, and they can actually see it unfold in front of them, which is quite interesting because really it is about the process, especially in higher education. The process is incredibly important, not just the product. And so they're trying something different, especially when thinking about informal learning. I just wanted to um, just interject with an with yes. interesting real world example here, especially as it relates to the emphasis on measuring learning. I know there's a lot of interest at CSUN right now around learning analytics which is great, but how do we assess the type of learning that is considered more in the creative realm? So one example of how a e-portfolio or something along those lines could be particularly effective is, I like to maybe give a, a personal anecdote, is I've recently decided to learn graphic design. Yay, sounds, sounds like fun. So my free time, scoured lynda.com videos, of course. Um, you know, took some YouTube tutorials, and I've been really stepping up my game and learning more and more. However, if I were to then transition into a formal learning setting like a university, how would I prove to the university that I'm ready for a more intermediate course? How do we assess what I've already learned informally in my own life so that it aids me and doesn't end up hurting me um, as I enter the you know, university by putting someone in a beginner course if they've already done the work informally? you might stifle the progress and make them enjoy the subject less. So uh, there needs to be, I think, a, a concentrated effort from universities on the types of skills that students already have going in and how we can assess 
those types of things uh, to get them placed in the, in the right areas. And one of the ideas that the Cork Institute wanted to put into place was the students take on the ownership for this informal type of learning and collecting these artifacts. Instead of it being driven at an institutional level, they themselves are owning this part of the documenting process, which we really want to encourage them to do that on their own so it's not always a top-down model. So moving right along into teaching complex thinking. This is really important, as you can imagine, especially when we're thinking about real world problems. And I think the AppJam is a great way for us to do activities that really engage the students to get them thinking beyond uh, just the four walls. And so one of the interesting facts I found was that there is a expected to rise 243% over the next five years for data specialists in the UK alone. So how do we cultivate this type of environment where these students are understanding and able to really contextualize data? So thinking about complex thinking and giving them new ways to experience it, addressing global and local issues through many different types of pedagogy is, is definitely a way to go about doing that. Okay, so one way that RIT is doing this is they have a thinking chair, which might sound a bit odd. It's actually a person. A person actually, it's an endowed chair. The person was uh, put in place. It's not actually a physical chair. It is a person. Um, <laughs> but it's quite clever. Sam put that together. She's laughing in the background. Um, so this chair that is at RIT actually was put in place to do think about critical thinking. So thinking about thinking, which when you wrap your head around it initially, it's, it's, pro it's a little bit hard to even fully contextualize. But he was put into place to come into the school and work with faculty to get them to think about real world problems and expanding their curriculum beyond what they already have and to really bring students into the fold even more and to think more critically, use more metacognition. And then also the students, how are they thinking critically? How can they grow beyond um, what they are currently doing and to take it beyond the walls? I mean, a lot of this is so much surrounding around this formal and informal learning and that blending of the two. We're seeing that a lot within this report. And the idea is these unsolved problems are big questions. You know, how can we tackle these even within the school? You know, how can we empower them to do that? And offering like an app jam is, is a great way to do that or other types of events around campus to engage learners in new and creative ways that they may not even have known that they had the ability to do. I don't know if, if you had people in the app jam that didn't know how to do any type of programming of mobile apps prior to, but it's very empowering. I've, I've seen even you know five, six year olds that are starting to think about app development, which can't wrap my head around that yet, but it's coming. How do we address that in higher education? That's a big question we need to be asking. How do we engage those types of learners? Complex models. So when thinking about models of education, we're seeing a lot of new models come out. You've got project-based learning, challenge-based learning, really thinking about this idea of real-world problems. And then also giving, giving learning opportunities at a much lower cost. So, of course, the idea of MOOCs comes up, the massively open online course, but how else can we scale that? How else can we engage even the students that are coming in? How do we think about how to engage them in our classrooms besides just looking at these larger scale types of um, opportunities? And one that I found incredibly interesting, which I didn't even, hadn't even heard about before, is Minerva University. And they're actually paired with Keck Graduate Institute to provide a seven semester opportunity for students to travel around the world. So in every semester, they're in a different location. So they start in San Francisco, and I believe they move to Bangkok, and they go all over, and they literally have hands-on immersive experience in that place. So the, the dean of the, the uh, program has actually put together all these different offerings of what they can do. So they'll go and they'll serve in a soup kitchen, or they'll go and work with a, a creative group of engineers at a location. They, they have all of these real world experiences that they are having while getting their degree as well. It's very much a, 
wonderful idea of a liberal arts type of education. And there's a wonderful video online if you want to hear more about this through Minerva. Uh, and you can look at the curriculum and they've really built out this beautiful idea of what real world learning can look like. All right, so moving right along. So now we are to our second question for all you tweeters out there. So what are some of the potential solutions that you could see to these challenges? And we're really asking you to dream big in this. How can we solve some of these dark, dark challenges? And I think a lot of you are already starting to think about that um, within your classroom and even you know, institution-wide. So keep that in mind. All right, so now let's move the conversation into technology. And that's one of the foundations of the Horizon Report is to really look at some of the new and emerging technologies and trends that are coming out. So we have our near term, which is one year or less coming to fruition. Midterm is about two to three years out. And far term is four to five years. And remember that this is all decided upon with the advisory board that actually does all the voting on this process. So it's not just a random group of people that don't have any connection to education. And it is a global look. And Samantha does a beautiful job at coordinating all of those efforts. So maker spaces. And I believe, is there maker spaces on this campus, I believe? Are you thinking about maker spaces, maybe? Seeing what the possibilities are? All right, so let's take a look at an example of a maker space. So Grand Valley State University has a center lab, a center where maker spaces is a part of it. But I'd love to actually show you a video that goes a little bit deeper into what they're doing specifically in their center. So the technology showcase is an immersive and engaging space uh, designed to allow faculty, staff, and students with the ability to interact, share, discover, and learn how technology can transform teaching and learning. The technology showcase uh, has been part of the new Mary Ivan Pugh Library Learning and Information Commons, and what the plan is is to bring in all sorts of technology uh, that's innovative, that's emerging, and also student projects as well. Faculty here at Northwest University are super interested in how technology can uh, transform the way they teach, and so part of what we have the technology showcase for them is the opportunity to become aware of uh, new emerging um, and innovative technologies that can help them become more effective in the classroom. Uh, one of the really cool things about Grand Valley State is the ability for um, students to access the free printer. And the free printer is open to all students and all faculty. One of the things that allows students and faculty to do is to visualize or to even prototype various theoretical um, concepts that they have. The Double from Double Robotics is a really unique uh, technology. It's a way to provide uh, telepresence. The Double uh, works by connecting through a Chrome browser or any iOS device. And it allows the user that's on the remote end to control and to drive the robot around. So things like virtual tours to uh, interact physically but also virtually is one of the benefits of the devil. I don't know but about you, but if I were going to a school that had the devil, was that the devil? Is that what it was called? <laughs> Speaking of the dark side. Um, <laughs> showing me around, I would be pretty sold. I think that's a really interesting concept to have this uh, devil showing me around campus. I think it's a, just an interesting way to bring new ideas and interaction to the forefront. Uh, another look, actually more in the K-12 space, is at the garage. And this is through USC. This is a four-year program that brings students in to have them look at art and design, engineering and computer science, and business and venture management. So they have interdisciplinary courses specifically tailored for the program related to those topics. And it empowers the idea of imagination and creative solutions. So in year one, students are thinking across all the disciplines. They're then moving into the applied skills piece of year two, 
And then from there, they go from conception to creation. And in that, they have access to this beautiful place called the garage that's got all the maker tools you can even imagine for them to actually create their prototype and bring it to an actual existence and test it out and showcase it. And then year four is developing their prototype and doing an entire presentation to potentially get funding, as Sam had mentioned earlier about us. Uh, venture capitalists coming in and actually funding different types of projects. So they're really trying to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to giving students the opportunity to try out new and creative things. Plus it's Dr. Dre's Academy, and there's something to be said for the, the cool factor. The beats. Especially in enticing students to actually get in the door. That's true. So this is just another way for us to look at some other models of education out there that are trying something different and new and kind of look to see what we might be able to draw from their experiences and take some ideas and put them into our, our classrooms or our institutions to engage learners in new and creative ways. Awesome. And um, because we always want to continue pushing the envelope, I'm going to take you through some of our far-term technologies. Um, and because we may have a little bit of time, I'm actually going to talk about some things that um, were left on the cutting room floor that may not have made it in this report. But we're, since we're looking at things from a five-year view, why not increase it and look at a 10 or a 20-year view? So come in soon. Um, wearable technology, um, aside from being a major buzzword, um, it is actually having, it does actually have some major implications, especially for nutrition education. Um, Right now, of course, there's a huge focus on the Apple Watch and all the smart watches that are now coming out on the market. OK, really cool for the consumer industry, but what does this mean for education? Um, well, the most exciting aspect of wearable technology is the, the quantified self movement. Uh, and what that refers to is the um, idea that people can measure their behaviors, their movements uh, throughout the day um, to become more aware of what their behaviors are, um, what their health needs are. Um, are they walking enough? Are they getting enough to eat? Um, all really important factors that, you know, I'll be honest, you know, it's great to have a reminder that I need to be walking more uh, in an increasingly, bu you know, busy world. Um, but, in, and I also want to point out that um, because smartwatches are so new, there's not yet a lot of um, evidence of, of how they're performing in education, but um, a educator in Australia is running, I, th I think, the first known or well-documented pilot uh, starting in September around how the, uh, the Apple Watch can be used for adult language learning. Um, I think the organization is called E20, so stay tuned, and um, if I'm back in the future, hopefully I'll have some results to share with you. Um, but beyond that, we're seeing crazy things that once felt super science fiction and unrealistic spring to life in the form of um, disposable sensors that are embedded in your eye the same way a contact lens uh, would that measures your saliva and other sorts of things um, and can actually do some early detection. Um, what if rather than, you know, making a, a doctor's appointment because you're not feeling well, you know, you can be feeling perfectly fine and not know that you have an illness or, or something going on. So for a device to be able to alert you that something's not right, go see a doctor, is really important and could, could really save lives. Um, and we're seeing more and more of that, as I mentioned, um, used in, you know, for nutritional purposes. Um, Fitbit and Jawbone Up, how many of you are currently sporting one of the two? You know, California is very health conscious. Okay, a few of you. I don't have one yet, so I'm late to the bandwagon. Um, but there are ma major implications, um, especially for um, people that are going to go on and, and, and teach physical education, and you know, and, and you know, warding off um, you know the obesity epidemic. Being able to start these habits young and, and integrate them into pre-service education, um, and you know, also equip nutritionists with this information is especially um, exciting for wearable technologies. Adaptive learning technologies. Um, we focused a lot on measuring learning, learning analytics, and I know when I was here last year, we talked about those items as well. Well, where is it all going? What's it all amounting to? Um, adaptive learning could really be seen as the next incarnation of learning analytics. Okay, we have this data. We know what students are which students are struggling. We know where they're struggling. What now? 
Um, you know, certainly instructors can't possibly cater to every single student, especially in large introductory courses. Uh, and in increasingly blended in online environments, there's a the potential to, for technology to take some of the burden off and to provide some of that tailored and personalized learning that students are really craving. Um, so adaptive learning technologies can take the form of apps, software, online learning environments, um, and probably you know the earliest examples would be, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know online quizzes that feed you a question, and right away, you know if, if you get that question wrong, it feeds you different content than it would if you know if you were a student that got the question right. Um, it really tracks student progress and tailors whatever content it delivers next, depending on what the student has demonstrated that they need or where they need more time. Or if a student is already excelling, uh, why bore them and disengage them? Give them new content, give them new subject matter to study. Uh, so that's the really exciting thing about adaptive learning technology. Um, a lot of work is being done by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, in 2013, they launched um, the PLN, or the Personalized Learning Network, which is providing um, funding to universities who are developing um, adaptive learning and personalized learning programs. Uh, and I know uh, the NMC is working closely with the foundation that there's going to be more opportunities to come. But the, it really is seen as a pathway to um, engaging the unengaged and making education relevant to each person. Um, and we all know people are, some people learn better through video, some like reading. Uh, and so to be able to be delivered content that not only best suits your needs, but your, your wants uh, is really, really important. And we're going to see more of that in four to five years. And by the way, when we talk about four to five years and mainstream adoption, um, we don't mean 100% of universities, so you know, universities shouldn't panic if they're not four to five years away or there yet. Um, by mainstream adoption, we refer to Jeffrey Moore's concept, which is 20% of educational institutions, and certainly um, CSUN is well poised. I want to point out an example of how adaptive learning is being used actually in a MOOC at the Ohio State University. Um, so the instructor who teaches the course has woven in some adaptive learning technologies um, to be able to cater to his you know, hundreds or thousands of students at once. So let's hear how that is going. Steal his idea. He gives you permission. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
really supposed to be better. I mean, we've already commodified education, right? This is not the world's greatest educational experience. It's a lot better if we get more people doing mathematics, right? That's a better experience for the student. I'd much rather than just do more problems. So if we're really trying to personalize education, then that kind of leads to another question. I mean, if I want this to be about one-on-one -on -one education, what's so massive about this experience? Right? And people have this mistaken idea that the and Boo stands for huge enrollment numbers. And I guess it does. But the enrollment isn't really a big deal, right? The point is that that's only a means to an end. And the end is data. Uh, I love that. Uh, he, not only is it a great program, but he is such a dynamic speaker, clearly. Um, but one other thing I want to mention about adaptive learning, and you know, we talk a lot about how it benefits instructors and they get access to dashboards or able to see student progress. But what about the possibilities for increasing self-awareness among students during such for a formative years in their life? Um, had I known, had I been able to see in a glance what my habits were, in what cases I perform best, I'd be able to develop better study habits, better learning habits. I, I would have learned to be a better learner. Um, and I think that's one of the most important aspects of entering a university, cultivating lifelong learning. How do I be a better learning for the re learner for the rest of my life? Um, and that is what is so exciting to me about the possibilities of adaptive learning, not just for instructors, not just for student retention, but for student growth for the rest of their lives. And I think that that's quite important, especially when we have so many kids coming out of K-12 that know how to test really well, but they don't know how to learn. And so giving them tools and opportunities to really understand and then having instructors that really can foster that idea of empowering themselves with data so they can grow as learners is going to be quite critical the more and more we see more standardized testing happening and teaching to the test in K-12. Well said, Holly. Especially, you know, especially important to recognize for departments of, of education. And um, as you wrap your heads around this next question, um, I also want to push the envelope a little bit further and, and talk about some of those items, as I teased, that were left on the cutting room floor. Um, some of the topics that I think we could even possibly see in next year's report. Um, there was a topic that um, almost made the K-12 report this year, which will be out in June. Um, and didn't quite make it, but that was drones. Yeah, quite controversial. When you, when you say the name, it, that was audible. <laughs> you know, that definitely has a reaction um, and not always positive, that's for sure. Um, but here's the thing about drones. I was skeptical too, uh, and then I had the opportunity to go to London for the, for the BAT conference, um, and I got to see drones for learning in action. Um, after presenting on the Scandinavian report, which is a lot of fun, I got to sit back and actually watch uh, middle school students present and what they were learning and how they were using technology. And I was blown away. Two, I think, seventh grade students demonstrated by using a drone inside of the room how they were learning really important and complex physics concepts by flying the drone, you know, me you know measuring where it was going and you know, reporting back. And that was their test. You know, that was how they demonstrated uh, their knowledge of, of, um, of physics, and perhaps most importantly, they said it was the most fun that they had in a really long time. Students who otherwise wouldn't dream of pursuing a path in physics suddenly were interested. Oh, we get to play. You know, this is considered play time for them, but it was actually deep learning, which is really exciting. Uh, another area to p potentially to focus on, um, I, I may have hinted a little bit of this last year, um, and I know it could be perceived as slightly creepy, but we talk about wearable technologies. Well, the next logical incarnation is embeddable technology, or technology that literally gets under your skin. Um, we, we've all watched Minority Report, you know, I have, you know, if you're a Blade Runner fan like me, it's, it's uh, you know, um, but, but embeddable technology is interesting in that um, the benefits are really, um, you know, unavoidable. Um, talk to people who have implanted um, GPS in their shoulder, it's really serious hikers um, who, you know, if they get lost, you know, it's able to set, send a signal and they're able to get help. I mean, there's lots of potential opportunities and while there's really nothing concrete for education yet, I would encourage you to think about what could the possibilities be? What could we dream up here at CSUN for how, you know, if we know a technology is coming and there's no avoiding it, well, how could we use it to empower us? Um, and then finally, 
the expert panel for the 2015 Horizon Report introduced a brand new topic uh, this year, which did not make the report, but I thought it was really interesting and I was excited to see it, and that was artificial intelligence. Um, how many people have been kind of following the robot sentience conversations happening at universities? I'm endlessly amused by it. Um, Stephen Hawking says yes, universities, other university people you know, say no, um, but the ability for, um, for us to be able to program machines to, you know, to, to do things in a way that the machines are then able to improvise um, and able to kind of think for themselves, um, as robot sentience implies. Um, Interestingly, you know, people say, oh, okay, you know, we're really afraid, <laughs> you know, what, what, robots, they'll kill us, they'll take over the world. Of course, that's one school of thought. But um, one researcher or scientist, and I think it was out of the University of, of Wisconsin, and I could be wrong, said, it's not the machines we should fear, it's the humans programming the machines. We need to build up the skill set of this generation of students to be able to develop the algorithms, uh, to be able to wield the power for good, so to speak. Um, and perhaps not as a direct result, we're seeing more and more of an emphasis on robotics and coding and curriculum, and it's starting younger and younger. Um, in Europe, there's national initiatives where um, learning HTML, Java, is as commonplace as learning a foreign language. Um, students are able to demonstrate their learning by building websites, by keeping blogs, and by the time that these students get to your, uni to your university, uh, they're going to have so much information and know how to do so much that universities better be prepared to, um, you know, foster growth in this type of student. Uh, so that is what is coming next. And if you want to have a say in what's coming next, and we want you to have a say, believe you me, uh, there's a lot of ways to get involved with the NMC and with the NMC Horizon Project. Um, as we mentioned, there's an expert panel every year. This is a, um, an advisory board of around 40 to 50 people. They're from all over the world, so the scope of our work is truly global. I will share with you that um, 2015 has been a tremendous year of growth for us, and uh, we're now approaching 6 million downloads annually, uh, which just blows my mind. Let me tell you, um, when I first came to the NMC, we were elated if we could get 100,000 downloads in a year. And, Six million means that there is a need for this type of analysis and timely research. Um, but as much as the NMC you know, puts out the final product, the expert panels drive the process. They are immersed in their environments and they're the ones in the trenches telling us what they're experiencing, what they're seeing coming next. And we create this online collaborative workspace for them with the latest research and prompts. And we really ask them to stretch their minds over the course of a month and a half uh, and, and almost, you know, in, in a friendly way, debate each other on what topics they think should make the report. Ultimately, we take all the topics, which together amount to maybe over 100, we put them in a voting system, and they all anonymously go in and rank the topics, and they decide the top, um, it actually starts the top 36. And then we, we release a private interim report, and then they narrow it down to the 18 that you see here. Um, and it's a reverse ranking process. We call it the survivor process. They actually vote topics off the island um, instead of voting for, which is, it, it's an interesting. First they vote for, then they vote against. Um, kind of like, you know, really puts you, in, you know, makes you look at things from different perspectives. So I'd invite all of you to serve, um, to nominate yourselves to serve on a future panel. We do around 10 publications per year. Um, you know, our, we have a globally focused higher ed edition, which is what we're discussing today. We have a globally focused K-12 edition, so if you're involved in pre-service education, that one's for you. Um, last year, we launched our inaugural library report edition, which focused expressly on academic and research libraries, and that um, was actually the one we were most shocked. It got a million downloads in a week. Um, <laughs> And a lot of it was about how libraries can better connect with their universities to promote things like digital literacy and what are the skills that you know, faculty and library professionals need to have to be able to really um, embed research better in, in the curriculum. So I highly, if you're, if you're working in the library or with libraries, definitely recommend you check that out. Um, we do a ton of regionally focused reports. So if you're coming to us from another part of the world that you have an expertise in, uh, we just published, actually, this is what I was doing at uh, 6 a.m. today, uh, an Ireland report, uh, and yesterday night on the airplane was the Australian version. 
Um, and uh, we have a Brazilian one coming out in October, uh, currently in talks with to do a Chinese K-12 report. Um, we really, you know, want, we, we really want to be wherever education is, which is everywhere. Um, so if you're interested in starting a new report that focuses on a specific sector or region, I want to talk to you. Um, another way to get involved is, you know, throughout this presentation we discussed anecdotes and initiatives that were happening at other universities. You might be sitting there thinking, hey, I'm working on a similar project, mine's better. Well, we believe you <laughs> and we want to hear about it. Um, we only publish what we, you know, what we know about. So I encourage you to submit a project. It could be in any stage, even if it's a pilot program. Um, there's a, a link to really, it takes five minutes to submit your project. All you really need is a website, a link to something, um, you know, to demonstrate what your project is. Uh, and you may see it in the next edition of the Horizon Report. And then, of course, as we mentioned earlier, we follow the NMCHZ Twitter hashtag very closely. And the NMCers love to share with us, you know, their favorite ed tech reads of the week just by using that hashtag. And then finally, good old fashioned email. Um, I'm always so happy to hear, <laughs> yeah. I'm always so happy to hear from NMCers. Um, we'd love to find ways to work with you more. Um, different projects are working on. Um, if you are ever, you know, if, if you ever, for example, wanted to bring in someone from the NMC and Skype in one of your classes with your students, we routinely do that. There's lots of ways for us to virtually connect. And um, if you aren't already going, we have our single face-to-face -face event that we do all year, which is our NMC summer conference, and that's in Washington, D.C. in a couple weeks. You know, so, you know, a bit of a flight, but if you can get there, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a, a chance to sync up with like-minded folks and even identify potential project collaborators. If, you're, if you've got a seed of an idea, we want to help it grow. So uh, with that, I want to say thank you and turn it over to you. Enough of, enough of me for, for questions. Yeah. And if you can't think of any, we will ask you questions. <laughs> You've been warned. Uh, just one quick question. I was curious, you mentioned about e-portfolios. And I was just curious what you're seeing universities doing in that space. Are you typically seeing them purchase an institutional e-portfolio product? Are you seeing students use kind of free things that are available? Just curious if you could talk about that just a little bit. That's right, and we talked to that in our, and about that in our phone conversation. Um, a lot of the, especially as it relates to um, sharing the informal learning, you know, going back to the blending formal and informal learning, we're actually seeing students use websites and, and platforms like WordPress or Squarespace that are really user friendly and easy to use to showcase, you know, their photography, their art, their fashion design work, or whatever it is that they want to showcase. Um, Tools that have been, you know, predominantly used in the professional world, like Behance, um, which is what a lot of, you know, creative consultants and graphic designers used, are actually being introduced into university settings as a way for students to document their progress in specific areas through their entire duration um, at college. Uh, what's your position on intellectual property rights with regard to the ownership of these uh, uh, services or products or apps? So I'm hearing a voice, but I'm not seeing where, it com where it's coming from, and I want to address. I want to address here. the person asking it. <laughs> All right. Did you hear the question? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did, and I know Holly will have a great answer too. But I want to. I just want to point out one thing that I failed to mention, and it's that all of our reports are published under a Creative Commons license. So our mission as an organization is to promote um, open access, open content, open, open everything, really. We encourage you to um, share the report freely and even remix it. So we've actually seen examples of people who've just exported sections of the report to build their own mini report from it. And we designed the report so all the topics fit on two pages, so you can do that. So, um, but I think another. I was referring to the students who oh. invent these products and deserve the right to own these inventions outright and capitalize on them. That's the incentive for faculty and students or any entrepreneur. 
Um, from what I've seen going in higher ed, most institutions, that is their work. They own a right, they own everything to it. They're just kind of a conduit to give them opportunities and a platform to showcase what they can do. I haven't seen a lot of examples of institutions saying, no, we own this because you were in our place when, when creating it. There's actually in the library report, it goes more into depth on making sure that if you're gonna, um, in the shift we're seeing of students as consumers to creators, there definitely needs to be um, IP um, teaching embedded into the curriculum because when students have the freedom to, you know, are, are turning in videos or projects, they're, you know, they're using photos from who knows where, so they need to be educated on also in their materials and, and fair use um, and, and copyright laws as well as we promote you know, this culture of creation. I think that's also been a shift for educators because it's, I know for K-12 specifically, it was the 30 second rule. As long as it's under 30 seconds, you can play any clip of music and we're really seeing that completely changed where it either needs to be your own creation or it needs to be free, open source materials that you're using. So we're definitely seeing some gray area that we're trying to clear up or people are trying to start clearing up. So um, a lot of these trends you've been discussing today are really promising in terms of spreading more educational opportunity. I like the adaptive learning and um, the, the, um, the, the blended, the, co the collaborative um, programs like the garage that you're talking about get me really excited, not only for our students, but for students coming up. But I'm asking this question as the mother of a tween who wants a YouTube channel. <laughs> and and I wondered if there had been much discussion of any kind of modeling for protecting personal information beyond the vulnerability of any given server or any given encryption. Is there any discussion of how personal information and personal security, honestly, could be protected online when you're sharing so much data about yourself globally, you know, the embedded technologies, all this stuff? Just coming from uh, the K-12 perspective, I am seeing more schools really embrace the idea of digital literacy and the importance of online safety. The concern that I have is a lot of it is just don't use it or stay away from that instead of empowering them and showing them the right ways to go about using it. So I think that there still needs to be a shift when we're looking at that, but um, I don't know, maybe Samantha's got something else. Yeah, I agree. I think um, there's been a shift towards um, banning something to making sure that there's um, you know, educational materials and, and lessons taught about, you know, about student safety and what it means to, you know, you know, be online safely. Yeah. Aside from the privacy issue of online databases, I'd like to ask a corollary question. One of the things that we experience in any new technology is this initial differentiation uh, such that a lot of people enter the space. In the cloud, to use a colloquial term, there are probably 20 or 30 different groups that are applying their trade, from Apple to Microsoft to you name it. My question to you is, how do we avoid designed obsolescence? That is a fantastic question. And one of those cutting, cutting room floor topics was uh, digital preservation and conservation. Are you speaking to um, different formats and different, like, it becoming obsolete and we lose our, yeah. That is a major, major concern. And Holly mentioned the need to train data specialists and data scientists to um, deal with this and perhaps it's so far being um, done most successfully in, in the museum space, um, where you know, art in many, you know, in, especially in physical format, now a lot of art is digital, and making sure that the intent of the artist is preserved um, you know, as, as a digital format becomes obsolete and they have, they have to switch it to something else. So um, I would just, there are some, and not off the top of my head, but I encourage you to go to the, to the wiki um, at horizon.wiki.nmc.org and there's a whole section on digital preservation and um, I think it mentions some of the different initiatives um, at a national, even state levels to work to uh, preserve um, this data and in, in the materials so that you know, whatever the next format is, uh, you know, they'll still be there.
Um, thank you again for another interesting presentation. Uh, one thing um, concerning is that we have these two kind of spectrums where we have the maker spaces on one end and MOOCs on the other of scale where we have these hands-on experiences that can only accommodate you know, dozens or maybe hundreds of students, and you have the MOOCs, which are accommodating thousands. Um, how do we bridge that gap, really, where we have to worry about trying to get that hands-on experience to thousands or millions of students at the same time? The first thing that comes to mind are virtual labs, remote labs, providing some type of experience. I think it's hard to think about you know, how to provide a makerspace type of feel online. I know people are trying to, to think about what that looks like. Um, but the only thing I've personally seen is this idea of a remote lab or a place where they can either watch it happening or go to a place and actually experiment, um, or even online if they build some type of tool where they could go through the experimentation process. I remember years ago when you were able to dissect a frog online. Does anybody remember that? You, you had the, um, that kind of concept. Sorry. I would have preferred that to be actually, yeah. I wish I, wish I had that. I um, wish I had never experienced that. <laughs> oh, man. But also, another thing to point out, and I, I know I, I played a video along these lines last year about uh, Fab Labs um, initiated at MIT in 2006. There's now well over 300 positioned all over the world, uh, mostly concentrated in urban areas. And one of the defining f features of these Fab Labs is that they're public. Anyone could access them at any time. So looking beyond the maker spaces that are housed on campuses and using public resources um, is another way to help bridge that gap. Um, we're also in talks, the NMC, with a corporation that I can't disclose, and we're recommending that they invest in more public maker spaces, especially in third world countries, so that there's, you know, to, to expand the access to them. Well, if there are no more questions, I actually, I want to hear from some of you, because my favorite thing is to do is to get out from behind the computer screen and actually talk to the people who, who are living it. Um, I guess, what, what are some exciting work that you're doing um, that applies to some of the trends and technologies we talked about, or even that goes towards solving some of the challenges we discussed? I want to hear. Yeah. In our special education department, we are using a virtual teaching system to to, for our teachers to learn pedagogy skills before they use them in the classroom. And I think we're one of about 30 universities using it, and uh, we're finding more and more applications for this virtual practice. Um, not only teaching, but working with parents virtually. Um, collaborating with other teachers virtually to learn the skills before you have to do it in the real world. So we like that. And it's a, a system through University of Central Florida. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Also in special education, but not unique to special education, is the concept of universal design for learning. And so we implement that pretty much across the board, universally, uh -huh. um, <laughs> in our instruction. but. Um, I mean, that wasn't brought up today, but you alluded to that in some of your comments. And I think um, across the board, the opportunities for universal design and learning, universal design and teaching, um, there's huge application here. Absolutely. And online, I think, can offer students a lot more opportunity to be able to experience education. Right, and, um, and particularly in the realm of blended education. Yes. So in, in that way, I think you, know, you have a lot of opportunity in terms yeah. of addressing things universally. Most certainly. Over here. Uh, hi, uh, at the library now we have the Creative Media Studio and it's uh, sort of a maker space. And uh, we encourage students from every major possible to come in and use the programs and software and check out equipment to make their own media. So that is related to the makerspace um, initiatives that you were talking about. So just wanna, yeah. And, and thinking, and one thing I wanted to mention about makerspaces too, because I think 
the concept of making could be daunting for someone who maybe is someone like an English major. Well, how does that type of major translate to, to making? And you know, as an English major myself, I had that thought uh, a couple weeks ago. And I started thinking about it. And I was like, well, I make stories. I make papers. So something that struck me is like, OK, maker spaces are also you know, they're, they're media centric. So how could we train you know, a, a someone with a writing focus to actually turn their, their works into, into things like videos? Yeah, and we've been doing workshops and trying to reach students and teach them how to use uh, some of the software that's a little more advanced and they wouldn't have access to otherwise. And um, I've partnered with a few faculty to do, uh, even for English classes, on doing their creative projects and um, helping them with that. Fabulous. Need more people like you, more spaces like that. <laughs> This doesn't amount to a movement, but it is something that I've tried on several occasions and had a great deal of success with it. I call it flipping the flipped classroom. Yes. <clears throat> Not flipping the classroom, but flipping the flipped classroom. Oh. And this is how I do it. I will take my lectures and put them on podcasts, put them online, let the students listen to them. During the, the lecture time, then, we go over the lab work, which consists of numerous problems. But then after we've done that, I use technology as a computer-mediated <clears throat> communication, which is where I think the premise of all of this starts. And that is that no learning takes place unless there's ego involvement. What I find is that the computer-mediated communication helps to promote that ego involvement. So whether it's asynchronously in the form of a wiki or synchronously in the form of collaborate or whatever, the point is that they have to get together and come to a consensus about what they just learned in the flipped classroom, and then they have to bring it back to the classroom lecture and compare it to what the lecture is. And it's uh, provided a kind of backup to a backup system for learning. It's been very successful. Grades have gone up geometrically. So how, how have you observed it that it affects in class time when everyone's all together, or, or has it? A couple of ways. First of all, everybody gets to know everybody in the class. So it creates a community of learning rather than individual learning. Secondly, it allows them to go back to what the outline of the lecture was and compare what they had consensually concluded to what I had given them as a stimulus lecture. And therefore, there's that cybernetic system of feedback. And kind of complex successful. thinking happens. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. More silence. No news is good news. Thank you.